Welcome to This Is Your Bible. My name is Frank Abel, and on the program this day is my guest, Mr. Gordon Hensley. Welcome, Gordon. Hi, Frank. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. And we'd like to talk to you about the Bible as a manual for life. Now, many people have used manuals and use them regularly in their day of work and maybe in their homes on a regular basis. But not many people ever use the Bible as the manual. Gordon, why would anyone want to use the Bible as a manual for everyday living? Well, I know it seems kind of strange, Frank, because uh, I think most people today think of the Bible as some old, worn-out book that um, had relevance a long time ago, but today is, is pretty worthless as far as telling us how to live with all the uh, uh, things that we have today that we have to deal with, all the different problems that we have. But in reality, things have not changed that much, and God is the one who made us, and because God made us, He knows what we need. He knows what makes us happy. He knows how we can be productive. He knows how we can be healthy. And that's why I think the Bible is a manual for life, because that is exactly what the Bible tells us, how to be happy, how to be productive, and how to be healthy. Well, it presupposes a few things, uh, really, Gordon. Uh, I suppose a lot of people today say, well, this is the book that was written, uh, I suppose, in some parts, some parts 2,500 years ago. Now, how can a book that's so old be relevant in the 21st century? Well, you know, if you think about it, the reality is people way back then had the same problems we have today. They were dealing with a lot of the same things we are. Now, their circumstances were different. You know, they didn't get up and get in their car and drive to work every day like we do, but they did work, and they did have problems in their families. They did have problems that they had to deal with just like we do. And so the things that were written for them, in general, are just the same things that uh, we need to know about today. So a Bible, a manual for life. Well, give me an idea, Gordon, of uh, what do you mean by a manual? Like in, in what categories is it a manual for life? Yeah, it's just like, a, it's kind of like a manual you get when you buy a new car. You know, you have different sections that tell you uh, uh, to rotate your tires, to change the oil, you know, different things you need to do to keep your car working well in the way that it was designed to work. Well, the Bible is like that too. Um, it's not talking about uh, things like changing your oil or rotating your tires, but little things you need to do in your life to make you happy, to make you successful, and to make you what God created you to be. Um, for instance, um, as far as being happy, uh, one of the things that really takes away from happiness in this life is, is worrying about things. You know, we, we feel like sometimes we have to control everything in our lives. And um, I'm sure you feel like I do that I really don't have the ability to control a lot of things. I, I can't stop earthquakes or tornadoes or or a lot of times even the problems that I have at work, you know, they're out of my control. And so the Bible tells us that God is the one in control. We don't have to worry about those things. We can allow God to deal with those things and we can concentrate on our own lives, you know, dealing well, with our own problems. That seems to be a, a pretty good reason to look into it because uh, obviously if God's in control and the Bible tells us uh, what he's doing in our life, then to not look at the book is a kind of a serious mistake, isn't it? I think so, yes. I think, and, and sometimes it's, it's difficult because we don't read that much today. It, it's kind of something in the past. We like to just turn on TV to get our news or the radio, and it takes a little effort. But, you know, if we look at a, a verse here in Proverbs 3, Proverbs chapter 3, it tells us uh, that we have to put our trust in God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And so we need to trust God with all our heart. Well, that's the easy said, but it's not easy to do, is it? To no, it's lean not. on him with your whole understanding is, is making God in a, in a very secure position, or at least you're in a secure position because you assume God's in a very secure, secure position. Now, how many people do that, though, today? Not too many, and, and don't get me wrong on this, I'm not saying that this is easy to do, to follow God's word is not necessarily easy, but it's worth the effort. That's my real point. That's, that's what I'd like to emphasize, is that it does take a little work, but it's worth what we have put into it. And there's a bit of a cost if you don't, isn't there? It's like uh, a person who doesn't understand when he sees a little red light blinking on his dash that uh, there's something about oil. It's exactly. a nice little friendly exactly. red light. <laughs> if you keep on going, you're gonna you're gonna end up stopping, which is what can happen in your now, life. Now, is the too. Bible written like this? Does it give us little red lights to tell us if something like this happens in our life, it's time to do something? I think it does. Yes, I believe it does. Um, 
if we uh, look at Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, we're told not to worry about things. And that's kind of a, um, like a red light. You know, it's that we're not to worry. And worry is one of the things we might do that's, that's very bad for us. Well, the little red light, I think, is, uh, is sometimes builds a lot of confidence into us because uh, if we believe the little red lights come on for reasons. That's right. If they, if they just happen to come on and go out and come on and go out, you tend to not regard them at all. But a red light indicates there's something needs attention. And if we react to it right away, uh, we can save ourselves a pretty big repair bill. And in life, uh, I suppose, uh, some very uh, costly mistakes. Uh, exactly, exactly. And, and worrying is a, is a big mistake. Um, if we look here at uh, verse 6, we read, be careful for nothing. If you look in some more modern versions, it would say, don't worry about anything. So we're not going to be worrying ourselves about all the little things that can go wrong because we know God is taking care of them. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That sounds like happiness to me. You know, having peace and not, not worrying about things, but having a peace that realizing God is in control of our lives. So let's just be clear here, Gordon, that, that not to worry means that uh, if we go back to our little analogy with a red light flashing mm -hmm. on our dash, is that there's a, there's a control panel there. Something's telling us something's wrong. We need to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So our worry is free on the fact that we are confident that something's taking care of those things. Otherwise, uh, you just run out of oil. Well, we, gotta, we, we don't <laughs> want to think that, that, the, uh, that Paul here is saying, don't worry about anything. In, in other words, I'll just sit down in my living room and never do anything, and everything's being taken care of. But it means don't have undue anxiety. You know, things are going to cause us to worry and to wonder about what's going to happen in the future, but we don't want to panic over them. We don't want to feel like everything's out of control because we know God's in control. Yeah, something like the Lord when he said, Take no anxious thought for the moral. Exactly. The moral will take care of itself. Exactly. Yeah. Worry about, if you want to worry in that sense, the things of the day. Because a lot of sure. us do, uh, considering ourselves with things that are really of no consequence. Exactly. And out of our control anyway. They're completely out of our control. Good. And that just makes so us that's, happy. So that's what you call happiness. Mm -hmm. Is there any further that you can think the Bible can speak of, of or tells us about happiness? Well, I think... Um, one of the things the Bible tells us that makes us happy that we might not think of is to, is to focus on things outside of us instead of always thinking about me, me, me. Um, we tend to always think about ourselves naturally, and we think that's going to make us happy, that the more we think, how can I be happy, the more we're going to make ourselves happy. And it is, works exactly the opposite of that. The more we think about others, the happier we become. You know, the more we show love to other people, the happier that makes us. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 4, for instance. We're going to see here in 1 John 4 that loving others actually comes from God. Well, this is some of the reasons, I suppose, where you, you look at the Bible as, as really being an owner's manual. Like, I mean, when you start to say that happiness is not associated with gratifying your self-interest, uh, that's now a philosophy that's not too human. In other yes. words, you've got you to go beyond what people normally think of. So the Bible's telling us things we wouldn't naturally know. Exactly. says this. And that's how we know it's from God, because people wouldn't think of this themselves. First uh, John chapter 4, verse, uh, start verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth, loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So we see that God is actually love. So love comes from God. That's where it comes from. And God knows we need to love other people. We don't need to think about ourselves all the time. We need to start thinking about other people if we want to be happy. How, how, what, what do they need? What can we give to others? Not always what can we get for ourselves. It's an interesting thing about the Bible, isn't it? Because as we mentioned, the idea of, of doing something out of self-gratification, out of serving self, can probably bring the greatest satisfaction and happiness that you can ever achieve in life. And uh, it seems to me the serving of others is something where people, you see dedication that you don't see in life otherwise, where people are very dedicated mm -hmm. in the service of others. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a quality of life now exactly. that's, uh, that's not achieved without knowing the way to that quality. Right, exactly. 
Well, it's interesting because the Bible uh, also goes on to speak of thanksgiving in a, in a somewhat similar sense, in that in being thankful, you actually are, are happier that way mm -hmm. because you, you recognize, and God being the one who wrote the manual, and who the one who is in control, you, you, it's nice to be thankful and to and to express thanks mm -hmm. for what God has done for us, especially if He's taking control, and we recognize that, right? Right. You know, and and thinking of of how that uh, we wouldn't normally think of giving love to others, that kind of leads us to another thing that we were talking about, which is being productive. Um, we don't we think of being productive sometimes as what can we get for ourselves, but but actually the Bible talks about productive and what we can give. Um, I'd like to look at a verse on that. Um, that is um, Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And I want to apply this to work. Now sometimes we think of work as uh, something we have to do and we don't want to do and we look forward to the next vacation, the next day off. But you know, God asks us to have a different attitude about the things we do in life. In uh, verse 23 here of uh, Colossians chapter 3, we're told, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. So whatever we do, and that includes work, we want to do it with our heart. And the interesting thing is that no matter how menial your job is, if you do it with your heart and you do it as if you really wanted to do it and you have the right attitude, you'll enjoy it a lot more. Well, so you're actually uh, getting something out of putting yeah. something out. Very true. I, I, saw, I sort of think that most people would understand that one of the worst things you can do in work is go down to the coffee table and bellyache about all the problems associated with where you're working. And people right. regularly do that. It, but yeah. to, to, to just have an, an attitude that you will not get involved in those things, but you will, it's like serving the Lord when you're working. A little hard to do in today's it is, world. It is. But yes, it does help. It helps, uh, I yeah. think, a person's mental health an awful lot as well. well it'll, it'll make you happy and it'll make you productive. You'll actually accomplish a lot more if you have the right attitude. And I think that's true in, in our home lives as well. You know, um, I heard recently that as many, much as 60% of all the marriages fail now. And you wonder why is that? And of course, probably the biggest problem people have is that they're, they're thinking more about themselves than the other person. And the Bible tells us to think about the other person. It actually tells us, for instance, that men are to love their wives and that wives are to respect their husbands. And uh, you'll find a lot of uh, psychologists today are saying that this is actually the, what men and women want from their spouses, that men want their wives to admire them and respect them, and wives want their husband to love them and cherish them. And, and here, 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote that. And yeah. so he knew from God just what uh, people needed to have a productive and happy marriage. And the same thing with raising children. You know, a lot of people today, um, they only think about self-esteem for their children. And now, God doesn't want us to feel like we're worthless and we can't do anything and, and we're nothing, but we have to have a balance in our lives that well, we have some feelings that God has given us some abilities. At the same time, we have to have self-discipline and self-control, and people have forgotten to give their children those. But if they read the Bible, they'd know that. The children yes. need those things. They now, people are not, not using the Bible as an owner's manual. Like there's very, very few people would feel uh, that confident. I mean, it's, it's because I suppose a lot of people haven't done their research as to why the Bible can be uh, a book that you can put your confidence in. But uh, even for people who do, who believe the Bible that way, living by it is, is uh, not often found that people have the like, I guess you'd call it the integrity of it. So people's word today, and in many cases, doesn't mean much. So uh, you know, people are prepared to go through marriage and, and say, you know, until death do us part. Mm -hmm. But when difficulty comes along, uh, the first thing happens and the marriage breaks up. Well, that's not entirely living by the manual, is it? That's not living by it at all. No, that you're, you're right, Frank. That's, that's the problem, is that they, they don't have a manual. And you'll often hear people say, you know, well, children don't come with a manual, but they're not right about that. That's, that's incorrect because God has given us a manual on how to raise children. And if we would just read it, we would learn how to, how to raise children and how to have a happy family. Well, I guess in uh, some ways we have to uh, stand away from society. Like society 
in terms of the way, uh, if we just look at the little area of discipline, of how mm -hmm. to discipline children, uh, has moved away very much from its uh, Christian roots on mm -hmm. how to discipline children. So we're looking at a society today where if people really use this as the owner's manual, you have to have enough belief in it that you're going to stand up for what this believes or what this teaches and, and follow it through in your life. If you're, uh, you're going to go for happiness, it's going to be a bit of a cost. Yes, there is. And you have to have, I, I think, the courage as well. That's right. You, it, it, is a, it is something you have to commit yourself to. You definitely have to do that, but it's, it's certainly worth what you uh, put into it. Yes. Well, take us another step. Okay. Uh, where, where, uh, what else would we use this book as a manual, Gordon? Well, this one may sound a little strange to you. Um, I believe that the Bible can actually teach you how to be healthy. And, you know, a lot of people are really interested in being healthy today. It's a, it's a health-conscious time. But the Bible told people since the beginning how to be healthy. Um, one of the uh, most remarkable uh, things that it talks about is prayer. Now, a lot of people think prayer is kind of silly. You know, why, why, why would you pray? Why not just do something yourself? But it's been found recently that prayer actually helps people, that it's actually good for you to pray, to, to commit. And it goes back to what we were talking about, trusting in God. You know, you're committing to God your life. So you're not worrying so much about things. And you, you believe there's someone out there who can help you. So you, you don't have to do it all by yourself. And that actually can make you emotionally and spiritually healthy, which, which leads to physical mm -hmm. health. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of research today on, on how our attitude can affect our physical health. In other words, if we have a good outlook on life, that will actually strengthen our immune system. It will actually make us healthier physically. Uh, and, and to show you that God knew about that, uh, Solomon talks about it all the way back in Proverbs. So what you're, you're saying then, uh, uh, Gordon, is that really behind what you're saying, I suppose would be the better point to start, is that if you've got to believe this book is the manual, like it's mm -hmm. not a matter of just opening the book and, and going to it like a manual in many senses of the world today because you just find a page and you do what it says, but to pray to God, you've got to believe God's there. You've got to believe that God answers prayer. In other words, you pray to the air. You, you pray to what? Right, right. It, it involves some faith to start with. Um, you do have to believe God's there, and you have to believe that he is going to listen to you. But um, the, the reality is he does, and, and you can test him if you want. You can find out by asking him to do something for you, you know, to ask him to answer your prayer, and, and you'll find that he does, that God does answer our prayers. And I think it's a real comfort, too, that he does. So you were taking us to a, a passage in Proverbs on health, mm -hmm. and I don't want to deter you from that okay. because I, I think a lot of people would be quite interested. We're a very health-conscious society. We certainly are. If you can take passages from the Bible to make us healthier, okay. then let us know, Gordon. Well, let's take a look at it. It's Proverbs 17, mm -hmm. it's verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And we know what a medicine is. It's something that makes you healthier. And having a, a merry heart or having a good attitude, being positive in life, is like medicine, uh, he says here. And then he says, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And I think we can get the, the idea of the picture there is that having a good attitude, a good outlook on life, actually makes you healthier yeah. than if you have a bad attitude and you're grouchy and you're, you're angry all the time. You know, that actually is bad for your health. Yes. Well, the, the Bible is an amazing book in the sense that uh, I think I would agree entirely with your looking at as a manual because, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it tells us something that I don't think you'd ever find this outside of the Bible. Like you may have many manuals in mm -hmm. life, but uh, you would probably, you'd probably never choose to do this. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he says in verse 16, for which cause we faint not. Now that's believers. That's mm -hmm. obviously people who use the Bible as a manual. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, that's something like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So we do see that our body fails. We right. do acknowledge that we do get sick. We do acknowledge that uh, we wear out. Right. And uh, ultimately, we succumb to these diseases and things. But the inward man is talking about the attitude, about the spirit of the person. And sometimes you see a very big spirit in a very little you know, infirm body. That's right. Well, that brings up a, a good point, too, is that you, the question might be, why, why the Bible? You, if you go into a bookstore, you're going to see a whole shelves of self-help books that talk about promising making you healthy or happy or successful. 
so why, you know, why is the Bible any better? And I think that that gets back to what you're talking about, that there's more than what we're talking about. We've talked about this life, what the Bible promises for this life, that we'll have a better life now, but it also promises more than that. So well, I heard another a few things, uh, uh, Gordon, that really scared the life out of me. When, when you look at what people see without the Bible, mm -hmm. with, with no manual, they, they look at life as a, sort of the marshmallow syndrome, where you can put the marshmallow into the fire once and it gets burned, you bring it out and it's a little less, uh -huh. and, and you can you know, skim that off and you can put it in a game, but you can only do that about two times and you're done. Mm -hmm. Or you know, you're burned out, which is another thing I suppose to our age that you know, we go through stages in life, but <laughs> when you've got the last stage, you're finished. Now, what, a, what a philosophy for life to think that there is no way to renew your energies. I, I think that's quite contrary to what the Bible says here when it talks about the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, how is it renewed day by day, Gordon? What, what, what's the way? Do I, like, where's the gas tank? <laughs> that's a good question. You know, how, how do we get refueled? Huh? I, I think that, that uh, there's only one way to do that, and that's to read it every day, to, to take it in, you know, to go through it. it it's a big manual, not, not a small one, so you, there's a lot to read. And there's a lot of things that we have to become acquainted with, and it can take us a lifetime. So it's not something you, you sit down and you read it for a little while and you put it, put it away, and now you know everything about life. But it's something where every day we have to take it out, read it a little bit, remind ourselves, oh, that's right, that's what God said, that's the way I'm supposed to live. And then we can put that into action in our life. We have to, you read the manual and you do what it says. And that's what we have to do with the Bible, is read it every day, renew our minds, Get, get it back, God's mind back into our mind because we think differently, as mm -hmm. we said earlier. Mm -hmm. We don't think like God does, but by reading it and seeing how God does think, we can begin to think like Him. Yes. And so then we can use that manual. Well, there's a there's a passage I'd like you to comment on in the okay. in the uh, New Testament. It's in the Gospel records, and uh, it was Peter. He was asking a question. I know Peter often asked questions, which were really what everybody wanted to ask. But Peter was the one that asked it. Mm -hmm. But he asked it in a way that uh, probably represents you and I, too. And, and Jesus was telling them about the things that they had to give up, etc. cetera. And, and, you know, Peter must have sometimes said, well, what do we get out of all this? And this is the way he expressed it. He said in verse 28 of Mark 10, Lo, we've left all and followed thee. Essentially, what are we going to get out of this? Now, Jesus' answer is really quite surprising. Do you want to just open that up a little bit? Talk okay. about that, Gordon. Okay, um, and that he, his answer that we gain things in this life? Yes. Well, I think that we, we may not think about uh, all that we gain when we become a believer in God and, and begin to read his word because God knowing what we need, one of the things he knows we need is other people. And he has set it up to where there would be a family of believers so that we would gain things in this life that we might not otherwise have. For instance, we may lose our family when we begin to believe in God. They may say, well, what are you wasting your time with that for? Why, why aren't you doing the things we want to do? And they may begin to separate from us when, when we begin to uh, live by the Bible. We may find we lose some things, but God has promised that for everything we lose, we'll gain something. Yes, well, in fact, the, 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 uh, the factor by which it is magnified is quite surprising because Jesus says you'll receive a hundredfold. Mm -hmm. Now, a hundred times as much uh, to a materialistic world sounds incredible. Like I'll put, I suppose a lot of people would say, "Well, look at the if the Bible can guarantee me a hundredfold, count me in." But does it count people in that are basically materialistic-minded? Is that what it's all about? Well, it does sound like a good investment, but no, that's not what it's all about. But it's an assurance from God that He's going to give us even more than we might lose. And again, it's, it's really the, the, along the same lines that we've been talking about, that whatever we put into reading the Bible, whatever effort we make, we're going to get more out of it than we put in. It's just like loving others. It's an effort. You, know, you have to put forth an effort to love someone. Maybe they're not that lovable, but you're going to get back as well as putting in. And that's true with st reading the Bible, trying to live by it. Um, by anything you might do for God, you're going to get back more than what you put into it. Yeah. The Bible is... Uh a very challenging book, isn't it? It's uh, very exciting in all aspects. Uh, people is. who have have come from backgrounds that are completely away from any of this sort of the heritage of people who mm -hmm. normally pick up the Bible, 
have come to it and have been profoundly affected by this book, such that they've left mother, father, they've left kids, they've left lands, they've left everything and had to give it all up. But the hundredfold increase is interesting in, in a couple other respects. Maybe you could just briefly comment on. Like he says, part of the part of the hundredfold increase would be mothers mm -hmm. and children. Now, how do you ever manage to do that through the gospel? Sounds a little strange, doesn't it? Well, you think of all the other people who are making the same efforts you are to serve God. They become your mother and your brother and your sister. You, you become part of a family, and it's a huge family. We, we normally think of uh, just four or five brothers and sisters as a big family, but it, it it's just encompasses a, a large number of people. So we actually are gaining. We have a bigger family than we started out with or that we might have lost. Okay, Gordon, in, in the little time we have left, would you, would you just summarize for us what your concept uh, is of this Bible, the Manual for Life? Okay, um, I'll tell you what, Frank, I think that the Bible was written by God, and we have to remember that. We have to believe that. A lot of people don't believe that anymore, but it's important that we do believe that the Bible comes from God, and, and God, having made us, knows what we need. He knows better than we do what we need. And so by following what God tells us in this manual, by doing the things that he tells us to, by, by following all the different little um, ways he has told us to make our life better, to make it happier, healthier, and more successful, we actually will do that. We'll have a healthier life and a happier life and a more successful one. And it takes a little bit of effort, but it's well worth it. Well, I think that's a, a very good point from which we can sort of wrap up our program. And, and look at the, uh, the point of the Bible as a manual for a life. I, no one would have any problems with understanding what a manual is. Like we use, we use books in the kitchen, recipes. We, we uh, go through our educational years, always looking at reference books to find things. So it's not surprising that if God created us, he also gave us a book of instructions as to how to live by. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Gordon, for going through that with us to illustrate that there's great benefits to people and the areas that we all want to benefit from, the idea of happiness and, and the idea of uh, our growing in our abilities, being productive, and uh, not the least of which is, is being healthy, coming out of it all, uh, being better mentally and physically for believing these things. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com Click on the Library tab and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, ThisIsYourBible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about his future kingdom on the earth.